The true crime story of today is about a first-time film director, Blaine Norris, a 25-year-old resident of Pennsylvania. Norris was known for being a horror movie geek and a nerd. Norris was obsessed with making his first attempt at movie making a success. The last thing he wanted to do was return to his job at Harrisburg Insurance Company where he worked as a computer technician. Norris camped out with a small group of amateur actors and actresses on the Appalachian Trail and began filming. The movie was about a group of young people hiking the Appalachian Trail who get murdered by the ghost of a coal mining baron. As the movie director, Norris had his friend and co-worker, Brian Trimble, who had his own equipment, film the scenes. An investor had put up $18,000 to complete the project. However, Trimble had put the project in peril by botching up the filming, causing the film to go over budget. The investor had withdrawn his money in frustration. As the cast rested for the night in their tents, Norris stayed up and pondered his situation. He was feeling the stress of not being able to pay for the film. He had lost his investor, and his credit cards were maxed out. Even worse, he had borrowed against his house without telling his wife. Further, she was frustrated with him for spending all of his time working on the movie. As he sat by the campfire, Norris could no longer ignore the obvious. He was heavily in debt and had run out of money to complete the film. Feeling defeated, Norris realized it was time to call it quits. He would gather his crew and return home the next morning. His lifelong dream had come to an end. That was all that he could think. The next morning, Norris drove home to his apartment. He and his family had moved there when the bank foreclosed on their house. He entered the apartment and found it empty. Everything was gone, including the furniture. He spotted a note and read it. It was from his wife. She explained that she could not take it anymore and she was taking her son and moving on. Standing alone in the barren apartment, Norris came to the realization that he had lost everything. He would have to return to his life as a computer technician. His dreams were not to be. The next day, Norris spent his lunch break with Trimble. Trimble confided with him about his own marital woes and Norris shared his hard luck story as well. Trimble told Norris he was sick of married life and his wife constantly following up on him. She always wanted to know where he was. He felt like his life was reduced to going to work and making his wife happy. This discussion resulted in the two men conspiring together to resolve their problems in a deadly manner. Trimble shared with Norris that he had taken out a $100,000 life insurance policy on his wife. He asked Norris if he would be willing to kill her. In return, he would pay Norris the money that he needed to complete his film. Norris was interested. He thought about the idea of reviving his life's dream. Furthermore, his friend would be free of his wife. Norris's desire to be a director kicked and then took over, and he and Trimble spent the next few months planning the murder. He staged and repeatedly rehearsed the murder with Trimble, just as he did when he was directing his movie. On the day before the murder, Norris went to Kmart and bought work gloves, a box of plastic surgical gloves, a hooded sweatshirt, and pants. He also bought a knife with a six-inch blade. On January 10th, 2003, their plan was put into action. Trimble and his wife, Randy, lived in a townhouse in the city of Harrisburg. While Randy was at work, Norris entered her garage and waited for her return. As he waited, he could not help dreaming about his future life as a movie director. He would have the insurance money to fund his film and make a major dent in his debt. Plus, he no longer had to put up with his wife's complaints. While Norris waited, Trimble was dining at a restaurant with friends. The dinner would provide Trimble with an alibi. Norris heard a car pull up in the driveway. It was Randy. She got out of the car and went inside her home. She slipped out of her work clothes and lay down on the couch to relax. Norris slipped out of the garage, threw a metallic object against her car, and then hid in the shadows by the side of the garage. As he hoped, Randy stepped out of her home to investigate. She inspected her car but did not notice anything suspicious, and then she turned around and made her way back to her front door. Unbeknownst to her, Norris had already made his way inside her home. Norris lay in wait for her inside the hallway. 
When Randy returned to the living room, he bided his time until she had turned her back toward him. When she did, he pounced on her from behind. He put a rope around her neck and proceeded to choke her. Randy managed to place her fingers between the rope and her neck. Though she was choking, her fingers prevented Randy from killing her. Frustrated, Norris cursed at her and stabbed her with his knife 27 times. When he was done with her, Randy was completely covered in blood, her hair was matted in it. Norris then ransacked the apartment to make the scene look like a burglary gone wrong. At 8.29 p.m., Brian called 911 and said he found his wife unconscious and bleeding. He also called his mom to say something was wrong with Randy. The police arrived at the Trimble home, and Brian is described as being in a state of shock. They also determined that Brian had an airtight alibi. He was seen at the restaurant by a friend and a waiter. When the police first looked at the crime scene, they found no fingerprints or DNA. Detective Les Freeling went back to the home a few days later to have Brian walk him through how he found Randy. Brian said that he found Randy laying face down in the garage, and he called out to her to ask her if she was okay. He said he nudged her with his foot and even stepped in the blood. Detective Freeling immediately became suspicious because Brian said he didn't touch Randy at all when he was first questioned. Once they did more searches, they also found evidence on Brian's computer. They found searches on a book called How to Commit a Murder. They called Brian into the station. Wendy Kessie, Brian's mom, said Brian wanted her to go with him to the police station. While they were in the interrogation room, the detectives offered Brian a deal of life in prison and would take the death penalty off the table if he confessed. Wendy said Brian asked her to leave the room. Brian said Blaine Norris was the one who killed Randy and that they had planned it together. The police went to search Blaine's apartment and car. They found a receipt for black clothing, gloves, mask, and a knife. Brian had told them that Blaine was going to buy all those items. The knife matched the wounds on Randy's body. Brian said he felt trapped and didn't want to put Randy through a divorce and was going to pay Blaine to do it. Blaine Norris pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. Brian Trimble also was sentenced to life in prison. The moral of this story is that pursuing one's dreams and ambitions should never lead someone to commit immoral or criminal acts. Desperation and financial troubles should not push individuals to harm others or engage in illegal activities. It highlights the importance of making ethical choices and seeking legal means to overcome obstacles and achieve one's goals. If you like this type of content, please to support us by following our channel. See you next time.